Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Nina just said, my name is Thea Kirai Tagle, and I'm so thrilled to uh, be the moderator for today's rich and interesting conversation uh, between four of the artists whose work is featured today in Between Bodies. Um, between Bodies, as uh, curator Nina Bozizhnik has framed, uh, explores multiple intersecting themes, including contamination, expanded forms of agency, and future imaginaries within shifting environmental ecologies. And today you'll have the chance to hear directly from Abraham um, Avnisan, Caitlin Berrigan, Misha Cardenas, and Patrick Staff uh, about their exciting interdisciplinary projects that employ, among other things, poetry, augmented reality, video installation, and even an anti-androgen herbal fog. Uh, so to begin today's program, I'm going to ask each artist to read a short piece in relationship to the artworks that are on view today in the gallery, and I'm going to introduce each artist just uh, prior to their reading. So to start us off, uh, we'll be hearing tag team from Abraham and from Misha. Uh, so Abraham Avnisan is an interdisciplinary artist whose work is situated at the intersections of image, text, and code. He creates applications for mobile devices, interactive installations, and technologically mediated performances that seek to subvert dominant narratives through embodied encounters with language. Abraham holds an MFA in Art and Technology Studies from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and an MFA in Poetry from Brooklyn College. Uh, last year, he joined the faculty of the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences at UW Bothell as an artist in residence. Uh, along with Abraham, we have Misha Cardenas, who is an artist and theorist working at the intersections of gender, race, and technology. She is currently an assistant professor of art and design, games, and playable media at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Before that, she was an assistant professor of interactive media design and interdisciplinary arts and sciences at the University of Washington, Bothell. And we miss her there very much. Her book in progress, Poetic Operations, proposes algorithmic analysis as a means to develop a trans of color poetics. She completed her PhD in media arts and practice in the School of Cinematic Arts at the University of Southern California. Thank you so much, Thea and Nina and everyone for being here. Um, and Ian and everybody who worked on this event today. So I want to uh, share a few poems that are from this same series of work of Seen Soul, but that are not in the installation. So your reward for showing up <laughs> is to get some uh, more of the background of this project. I woke up with a pain in my chest to the left. I worried that it might be my breast implants or my heart. But when I walked into my living room, the living room of my pod, the orange light shining through the blinds told me that the smoke was back. My fingers lifted a blind, and I looked out into the gray haze. No visibility. Dear Aura, if I have this pain in my chest, and you have this pain in your chest, could it be the same pain stretched thin across time until it wraps back around, twisting onto itself like a Mobius strip of particles per meter, per bronchi, per alveoli? It hurts from the inside out. Micro abrasions, like the bio lungs, been bruised black and blue and gray. My friend Ao checks in on me with an encrypted message. We had to take some space. I haven't seen them in months. They tell me they're checking in on all their friends who have chronic respiratory illness. They tell me they did pulmo this morning, and they are staying inside, afraid, frustrated. Dear Aura, I wake from a dream you aren't in, not knowing where or when I am that strange sense of time falling out of joint, your absence as conspicuous as a phantom limb or lung. The baseline is shifting, a symptom of our fuck-all approach to mending the planet we once called home. That close, dead air, all this dying. The light today is redder, softer, 
almost gentle if you can trick yourself into pretending. Summer snow keeps the temperature nice and cool by hiding the sun. The smell of summer snow fills my nose, burnt, smoky, filthy. It comes in swirls, falling through the wind, spinning, sliding flakes, gray and white ash. I try to keep it out of my eyes, and I pull my pup along to get us inside faster. She doesn't know why. She looks at me with concern in her deep auburn eyes, panting fast. Dear Aura, I play your hollow missive like an angsty Luke watching Leia's plea to Obi-Wan on repeat. If only we could change the way this ends, turn back time as easily as pushing qubits round our quantum forecasters. I turn the thing round and round in my head, but the magnitude of the loss is beyond what this bio brain can fathom. This is a species cleansing, and we are powerless to stop it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next is Caitlin Berrigan. Caitlin works across performance, video, sculpture, text, and public choreographies to engage with the intimate and embodied dimensions of power, politics, and capitalism. Her recent book and ongoing series of work, Imaginary Explosions, was the subject of solo exhibitions at Broken Dimanche Press in Berlin, at Academy Schloss Solitude in Stuttgart. Her book, Unfinished State, is forthcoming from Archive Books Berlin with support from the Graham Foundation. Berrigan has created commissions for the Whitney Museum, the, the De Cordova Museum, and the Harvard Carpenter Center for Visual Arts, among others. Thank you, Thea, and thank you, Nina, uh, for bringing us all here, and um, thanks, everyone, for coming and the incredible team at the Henry. Um, so uh, I will read from Imaginary Explosions, which is um, a book that I finished this year and um, kind of proceeds and is incorporated into much of the work in the galleries in this show. So um, I'll just read a few excerpts from uh, this book. The town is a narrow spine. They call it that too, a name to mean narrow, a margin of a city assembled along the higher confine between two tight valleys. This whole region accumulated from fluid, effusive lava. We amble about in peripatetic exertion, walking its length to find a moment of elevation, and all this search for vistas, but the volcano cannot be seen. These low-altitude passes named by white settlers turned cannibals seem quaint. Now that we can cut straight through rock, Donner Pass, Jubilee Pass, Ebex Pass, the old Spanish highway, here I can drive 100 miles per hour and feel like nothing is moving, least of all tectonic time. Even at this speed in a car, which is a body of metal, it surges in my sight this dense, dark streak of vitreous pumice trapped below layers of earth that account for all of human time and deeper. Not even the Shoshone Indians would have memory of this eruption in the Miocene that plated the desert with an undulating tuff of black glass. It would be invisible if it weren't for the desire to transport petroleum through these incised road cuts that make up the dry, sectional anatomy of Death Valley Highway. But the faults in this basin are young and unpredictable. From a vista in Joshua Tree, people watch them crashing into one another. From there, you can see the earth collide as a spectacle of muscular snakes. This is no natural disaster. It is just the natural consequence of two people fucking having fucked. Fuck. 
the tourists and their picnics. Fuck this measured green leisure. Fuck all the children discovering the softness of grass. This distance I arranged so you would not have so far to fall to earth. It is like flying through winter, but it is July. I will not be born for another year. The gray and white clouds are heavy, but do not adhere. They will continue to reach higher altitudes as my mother descends and sees through the window a hole, mostly black. At the center is a still orange spot, light from melted stone. It is quiet and bright, but not sharp enough to hurt the eyes. I would have wanted the plane to tip and let gravity take me in, but my mother has never transformed the aftershocks of violence against her into self-annihilation. However, she might claim that she didn't fly over a volcano, but instead a secret geological site where the military has just made Earth its new weapon. Big, dumb rocks. Even an entirety must have an edge. Just as the continents drifted before, leaving a line against water, California, it will happen again. They've been predicting it all of our lives, and even before, all the faults will split at once and drop California into the ocean. Cliff crumbs, crumb cliffs. But before half of it is submerged under water, California will burn. Because we grow up in a drought seven years long, because what we think are rocks burst into crystallized dust under the pressure between our fingertips. Our bodies have a thirst to be immersed in water. All the creeks are dry, and anyway, we are too young to know they ever carried water. But there is a private reservoir still full. I learned from her the practice of disobedience, how to switch off the motion detector light on the porch, how to move in a way to be mistaken for an animal. There is nothing but night in the mountains at night, hardly headlights or a bulb to captivate a moth. No fences, only trees. But the property lines are known. The children may run through the woods along paths made by deer, but only one creature will be punished for trespass. Heat from their bodies cannot evaporate the wet evidence of the reservoir on their skin. I can't imagine that a 12-year-old with braces would give a good blow job. But I can imagine that under threat of a neighbor with a gun in the night in the mountains at night, that she might find it doable. After annihilation, I am becoming mineral. Thank you. Last but not least, we have Patrick Staff. Patrick works with film, dance, installation, and performance to trouble binaries within medical, legal, and political conceptions of gender, health, and ability. Staff's recent work has explored the intersections of intergenerational biography, queerness, illness, and contamination to reflect on disciplinary structures that form and are reproduced in the body. Solo exhibitions of their work have been held at Commonwealth and Council Los Angeles and MOCA Los Angeles, among others. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, s similarly, thank you to the Henry for putting together this incredible group of artists, and thank you for everyone's work involved with making it happen. Um, the work I have in the show is a collaboration with Candice Lynn, who unfortunately is not here. And um, 
Candice and I often write together as a generative process in, in the making of our work. Um, sometimes we write together in more legible forms that are publishable in catalogues or texts associated with the work. Um, other times we just text each other furiously from our beds or wherever else we are. And um, one thing we often do is a kind of free, free form of writing together. Um, we often pass pages back and forth and just kind of freestyle and time ourselves. And so I thought it would be kind of more fun to read to you one of these texts that's um, just one of these free form writing exercises. Um, so inevitably there'll be parts of it that don't lend itself well to being read aloud. There are parts that seem scattershot or sentences that kind of end and are picked up by someone else in a way that doesn't quite make sense. Um, but I'm going to just read it out for you and see how it feels. Um, okay. I only try to make sense of my desire after the fact. I'll want to fuck in a certain way at first, and then I can only figure it out afterwards. Or it just happens, and it's only later on that I can give it a shape. I feel like that about wanting to be lost in smoke. To seek out other bodies, other ways of being, other ways of fucking inside of a cloud. I don't know if it's because I want to lose my body or multiply it through touching and being touched, or if I want to dull the most dominant, if able, of our senses, that of sight. If you're lost in a thick fog, are you seeing at all? You might start seeing more because your eyes aren't able to deceive or distract you. I know deep down that believing I have a body simply because I can see it is a foolish endeavor. Believing that I have a body because I can see it tricks me into believing that my body only extends as far as its edges. That there are edges and I see them and that's where I end. This isn't a truth. It isn't even close to being true. I not only extend, but I damage and I leave waste. I'm both in a fog and made of it, and I go beyond it. I shit it out, and I fog up the windows. I can fuck inside of it with many bodies, many hands, many holes, and many dicks. Believing that I can see, and that what I can see and read is how I keep myself safe is also a lie. I think I enjoy fucking in smoke because I know that safety is a falsehood, and the lengths that I go to preserve this fake safety in fact bore me. I never chose this, but I was taught it implicitly, always, and I'm aware that it makes me compliant. The ugliest parts of myself, this love of sight as my dominant strength, it makes me lazy. I want to be at a loss and full simultaneously. The first thing I feel is fuzz, almost like the velvet feeling of opiates numbing my ankles, elbows, and knees, and then through the dank smell of rotting fish, mildew, and sweet Paolo Santo, I realize it's external to me, whatever that means. A snaking, furry being that touches me only in points of articulation, like the tender, testing touch of an executioner before he breaks me on the wheel. When my joints are broken, I no longer know how to reach, how to point, how to move and flex towards another individual being. When my hinges are flattened, fragmented into pieces, and lashed to a metal wheel, I start to see a new circularity. August Kekule understood the hexagonal structure of benzene through a revelation of the Ouroboros, the phallic symbol of the snake circling in on itself to give itself head, to eat its tail, to make the most perfect whole, infinity. And you might think, as the electricity of cattle prods on timer belts jolt sharp stiffening pains into your flesh, that you, you are the one that probes the whole, that the whole is dark and black, and that your cock is this beam of ethereal white light, bringing enlightenment to the feral masses within, dark blinking savages who don't know any better, who smell like the death and pieces of shit that you think them to be. You might think that this fog is utopia, where we meet as equals in visual blindness, that the aspiration to color blindness is yet another form of violence and violation, but something generous and sweet. No, nope, stop there. It's liquid first. Not free flowing like water, but a sticky liquid, viscous and hanging, you can roll it between your fingers like when you're wet and you've been teasing yourself. Wet and sticky like that which soaks the towels in your bathroom, the mildew on your carpet, in the black mold that grows on the ceiling. You breathe it in in the hope that it will change your sex. 
a slow something in you, a reorganization, until that infinity structure switches. It's simple. It shifts on its axes. You do it too. It and you, neither separate nor unified. What touches your skin feels different now. The cum that dribbles out of you changes its taste. It tastes different when you lick it off of your fingers, and as afraid of you are as drowning, your nose and your mouth and your eye sockets and every pore are poured into, overflowing and reaching. There are two fingers inside of you, and your arm is deep in another. Um, and I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.